Hello everyone, welcome to the course in Trafficking in Cultural Property. It's really wonderful to have you here and I hope you will enjoy learning more about this important topic. My name is Virag, I'm your course instructor and mentor and this is our first lecture which is an introduction to the world of trafficking in cultural property. As you can see, this is our first lecture, but also please remember that at the end you have to take a quiz to obtain the certificate I mean at the end of the sixth lecture. Today I would like to go through the basic terms and concepts regarding our topic. If you have any questions or comments, please let me know in the Google Classroom and I'm happy to answer them. So let's begin. First, I would like to talk about cultural property, because this is really the basic for our topic, isn't it? If you think about this phrase, I think the first words that come to your mind are books, manuscripts, collections, maybe archaeological objects, sites, works of art, and so on. So think about it. What is common in these things? Well, all of them are tangible. They can be religious or secular, but they are all part of the cultural heritage of humankind with their universal value. More specifically, the Hague Convention defined the term of cultural property as such. The term cultural property shall cover, irrespective of origin or ownership, a movable or immovable property of great importance to the cultural heritage of every people whether religious or secular. And then it gives you the examples that we just mentioned, like books and manuscripts and archaeological objects. B, buildings, whose main and effective purpose is to preserve or exhibit the movable cultural property. So we are talking about museums, libraries, other collections. And C, centers containing a large amount of cultural property. We will talk a lot about protecting cultural property from smuggling and trafficking, but first I would like to give you an example that is a first line protection of cultural property. The Blue Shield is an independent, neutral, non-governmental, non-profit, international organization, and they intend to protect cultural property, especially during armed conflicts wars. It was founded in 1996, and they use the sign of a blue shield in order to identify cultural property that should be protected. So you can see it on the pictures as well, that these signs are literally attached and drilled to museums, libraries, or they set up in archaeological sites. So all sides of the armed conflicts know that they shouldn't attack or destroy that property. Protection during armed conflicts is a special concern of Blue Shield, but it is also in their mission statement to have the preparation and training of those responding to cultural and natural heritage damage during conflicts or natural disasters. They have different missions. Um, for example, the Mali mission, where the goal was to evaluate the current situation in northern Mali after the recent armed conflict that you might aware of. You can scroll through their website and you can see all of all their missions. So you probably remember to the name Timbuktu. There is also a movie um, with this um, name and uh, it's quite a bloody movie, but if you're interested in the topic, I recommend um, to watch it. Um, anyways, Timbuktu was a very important intellectual and spiritual capital of Africa in the 15th, 16th centuries. And it was home of the University of Sankari. Now this university, imagine, this university was capable of housing around 25,000 students in its golden years. So we are talking about again, 15th, 16th centuries. And it had one of the largest libraries in the world with 
more than 400,000 manuscripts. Because of its cultural value, the city was obviously designated a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1988. But following the Northern Mali conflict in 2012, many of the manuscripts were reported to be destroyed, along with many other monuments and medieval culture in general in Timbuktu. The library containing thousands of manuscripts was burned. And in that time, thousands of manuscripts, some of them dated back to the 13th century, were smuggled out of the city in order to save them. And later, many different restoration projects had started in Timbuktu, including the digitization of these saved manuscripts. And actually on Google Arts and Culture, you can explore some of the digitized manuscripts. Um, it's super interesting. I highly recommend uh, to check them out. Up to 40,000 pages are now available online, covering topics like biology, astronomy, mathematics, law, philosophy, and many others. It's a huge intellectual project of our time, and I highly encourage you to be part of it. Um, I brought you an example on the slide, an arithmetical manuscript. Um, this, is, this is also available online, so please check them out. Now, this case also represents something super important regarding our topic, namely that destroying cultural property is a criminal act. And this was the very first time that the Hague court found someone guilty in destroying cultural property. So this guy called Ahmadi, and he was sent to prison for nine years in 2016 after pleading guilty to war crimes for his involvement in the destruction of 10 mausoleums and other religious sites in Timbuktu. I and we hope that this is just the beginning. Now let's move on and talk about our next term, which is trafficking. You can see different official framings, but the main point is that the trafficking in cultural property is the illicit moving of cultural property. For example, looting of cultural heritage institutions, private collections, or looting archaeological sites, or the displacement of artifacts due to war. These processes are mainly organized by criminal groups who earn a lot of money out of this activity. And we will talk about it in details, how it happens exactly. But in this introduction, I would like to just draw your attention to the question, why is it important to talk about this? Why are we here at all? And why do we deal with this topic? Well, I could answer the question with the old proverb that we all heard at least once in our life. History is life's teacher, historia est magistra vitae. But if you think about it, there is really something fundamental in this proverb. I like to think about history as a book of experience. We spend some years on this globe, 20, 30, 40, 100 years, who knows? But our time is limited. And history tells us what people before us experienced and found out so we don't have to start from zero. It's a huge advantage. It's super powerful for humankind that we have history. This is the key to make this world a better place for us and to learn from our mistakes in the past. I listed other reasons on this slide, such as the cultural property consists of objects, buildings that were created by people who transmitted wisdom through these artifacts. Cultural property is part of our common heritage as humankind. Now, trafficking in cultural property is a substantial source of illicit profits for organized criminal groups. This is why we call them bloody artifacts in archaeology, because literally human blood attached these artifacts and we should talk about this problem. Crimes against cultural property is a crime against individuals communities and cultures. And this is something that was also recognized by Hag in, in the Timbuktu case that I just talked about. Cultural property is a unique testimony to the identity of people. 
And it's super important to talk about the archaeological loss as well, because when archaeological sites are destroyed, humankind lose knowledge of the past forever because of the archaeological method. Once something is excavated, we lose the context. And for us archaeologists, the most important part of the whole excavation is actually not the object, but the context where that object comes from. And that's exactly what is destroyed when somebody looted an archaeological site. In the next two slides, I just wanted to show you how big is this problem and how global is it. It affects all of us, wherever you live on this globe. You can read cases from Iraq, Italy, Bangladesh, Eastern Europe and so on. Let's take an example. In Italy, in Cervatei, 400 to 550 Etruscan tombs were looted after the end of the World War II. In 1995, at the free port of Geneva, a stock belonging to the smuggler Medici contained 6,000 artifacts. At the end of the independence war in Bangladesh, 1971, 2,000 Hindi temples were destroyed or seriously damaged and 6,000 scriptures were exported by smugglers. But I could also talk about the at least 1,000 objects worth more than 10 million US dollars, which are illicitly excavated every month in the Mayan region of Central America. Or that in 1992, 5,000 icons disappeared from Bulgarian churches. Or that in Turkey, from 1993 to 1995, at least 17,500 investigations have been opened for looting arts. So you can see that this is a global huge problem. And this problem became even bigger during COVID, 